Good afternoon, pilot teachers and good afternoon students. Good afternoon. Thank you, sit down. Okay, we are going to continue on with our work today on looking at um, land use on Java. And from our lesson, or the last lesson we had, we looked at the different land use and we were looking at rice cultivation mainly. Our lesson today will be basically looking at a summary of the land use, mainly to do with rice cultivation on Java. And as well as that, we are going to look at generally rice, the plant rice itself, and also the different perhaps layers to a grain of rice. And that's what we are going to look at for our lesson today. We start off with a summary on the different land use, mainly on rice cultivation. We were able to look at a photograph or picture showing a typical scene of what the um, rice growing areas of mainly the monsoon Asia region would look like. And on the monitor, we have an example of terracing, which is a common practice, mainly in areas where it is hilly or slopy to allow for space so that rice can actually be grown on. So on the monitor, we have an example of terraces being built for the cultivation of rice. We are going to go ahead to looking at the different processes which are in, involved in the cultivation of rice. And for that piece of work, we are going to look at the flow chart as well as information from our booklet, which contains descriptions of the different processes that are actually involved in rice farming or cultivation of rice. When we are looking at farming in geography, it is very important for us to be able to identify, first of all, the inputs into any type of farming, whether it be intensive farming, extensive farming, arable farming, pastoral farming, commercial, subsistence, or etc. In any system that we study in geography, it is important that we look at the system with inputs into the system, the processes that are actually involved in a system, and the output in that particular system. So in the case of farming, mainly rice cultivation or rice farming, we're going to look at the inputs into rice farming, and the inputs will involve both the physical and the human inputs. We are going to look at the different processes which are actually involved in the cultivation or farming of rice, and the output is obviously rice itself. So with our work today and the information from our booklet, if you can make reference to your booklet on Java, you will note that we are going to skip or we are going to leave the information on historical Java on page four. And we will come to that later on. Because we are on the work on land use, we are going to actually move on to looking at processes, input and output of cultivation of rice. So we are going to go ahead now to looking at information on rice and then after that we will come back to looking at the information on historical Java. I think correction, is it page four or page five? Or page six, okay. Page six contains the information on historical Java. That is the information that we will leave out. We will go ahead to looking at rice and the processes of rice farming. And then we will come back to looking at that information on page six for historical Java. Okay, we're going to look at mainly rice growing on the island of Java in Indonesia. And we were able to look at that map yesterday very briefly. That particular map gives us an idea on the two types of rice fields and the two types of ways or two ways in which rice is actually grown or cultivated on the island of Java. And the two ways are through the, um, sorry, the wet paddy or the sour fields and also the dry paddy or known as tegal in Indonesia. So when we make reference to the word sawa, we are looking at the wet paddy fields in rice growing. When we are looking at the word tegal, then we are making reference to the dry paddy fields, mainly in Indonesia. You look at the map and the key, the symbol with the lines going across, they represent the areas of sawa, that's the wet rice cultivation, and the areas that have dots on them contains regions where dry paddy or tegal is actually practiced on Java. You should have a sample or a copy of that map 
on one of those maps that were distributed earlier on. So looking at the farming system on Java or in Java, and to summarize, so you will be expected to make note of that information. You can also double check the worksheet or the handout that was actually distributed. Perhaps the information is already contained there, so you can go through. For those who don't have that information, you'll be expected to make note of that summary. The type of farming, tegal, we already know. It is to do with the dry fields or dry paddy. The method is mainly dry fields with no irrigation. Types of crops that are actually grown mainly in the dry farming or tegal in Java would be maize, cassava, and sweet potato. And rice, if it is grown in the type of farming referred to as tegal, then it would be mainly the upland paddies. In other words, these are rice grown in areas whereby there is not a lot of water required or needed. And that's why it is called dry paddy or dry paddy. Distributed on hill slopes where irrigation has not been well developed. Some of the crops that are actually grown using this type of farming, which is the dry farming or tegal, would be upland paddy. That is to do with rice growing, but in the upland regions of Java. Maize, cassava, and sweet potato. We move on. The second farming system in Java will be that of sour. And for sour, we are looking at irrigated fields. This time, we are looking at fields being irrigated or flooded so that actually rice can grow in. And where we have fields that are flooded for rice to grow in, then the type of farming in Java that is known as sour. The main crop then that would be used in the type of farming known as sour is paddy or paddy which is mainly rice. Distribution, northern coastal lowlands of Java where the fertile, uh, sorry, also on the fertile valleys and the irrigated terraced hills and slopes of Java. So those are the areas whereby sour, the type of farming would be commonly practiced. We move on. Farming system in Java also includes gardens. So when we talk about gardens, we should be very, very familiar with gardens in Papua New Guinea. And the method would be both wet and dry fields. Gardens can actually grow in both wet and dry fields. Some of the crops that actually are grown in gardens on Java would be rice itself or paddy. We have vegetables, coconut, oil palm, rubber, sugar, coffee, tea, pepper, and tobacco. Those would be some of the crops that would be grown in gardens. Distribution of the farming system of gardens on Java, it's throughout the lowlands and the fertile volcanic basins, especially near the large towns. Why near the large towns then for gardens? To be able to feed the population of the people living in towns and the cities. Okay, and finally, the fourth one, the type of farming or farming system in Java would be that of plantations. And when we look at plantation, method would be usually large estates with one crop. That is the main characteristics of um, plantation is that they are usually specialized in one type of crop only. And some of the crops that are grown in plantations on Java would be rubber, sugar, tea, coffee, and chinchona or chinchona. Okay, and those are some of the crops that are grown in plantations. Let's look at the distributions of plantations on Java. Tea is mainly on Western Java. Sugar grows mainly on Eastern Java. Rubber and coffee are widely distributed mainly in the hill areas. Remember, coffee would grow best in higher altitudes, whereby the temperatures would be a little bit lower compared to the lowland or the low, low alti um, altitudes. In Papua New Guinea, similarly, coffee is best grown in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, similar to tea. If you try to bring coffee and tea and grow them, maybe extensively on the lowlands or the coastal areas, it might not grow as well as up in the highlands of Papua New Guinea. So similarly, when we look at the distribution of coffee and tea on Java, 
most of them would be mainly in the highland areas of Java. Okay, those are the farming systems and the four main types of farming practiced in Indonesia, especially Java. If we have to look at them again quickly, we start off with plantations, gardens, sawa, which is to do with wet, flooded fields for growing rice, and tegal. So those are the four farming systems practiced mainly on Java. Now we come to looking at rice. Rice grows mainly on sawa and also tegal. In order for cultivation of rice to actually take place so that a good harvest can be actually made, certain uh, processes need to actually be followed. You are going to look through your booklet and your booklet gives a very good description on the processes that are actually involved in the growing of rice. So if we look at page seven of our booklet, under the heading on rice, onto page eight of your booklet, page nine of your booklet, they contain descriptions involved in the processes of rice cultivation. And your task for homework will be to read through that information. What I will go through now is very briefly some of the main process that are actually involved in rice cultivation. So don't forget your homework is on page eight, seven, eight, and nine, whereby you are required to read through the information that is presented in your booklet. But some of the processes that are involved in the cultivation of rice are, first of all, it is very important for the preparation of the fields. You need land. Land is a very important input into rice growing. Without land, rice will not be able to grow. You have to prepare the lands or the fields. Then the nursery of the seeds, rice seeds, very important. That's the next phase. Terraces would usually be built when you are preparing the land. Also in preparation of the fields, some of the processes like paddling action, the stomping action are required to allow for the fields or the land to be suitable for rice growing. Then comes the planting, whereby the rice taken out of the nursery is actually planted into the fields that have been prepared. While the rice is growing, weeding is required to remove any unnecessary weeds that might kill the rice or the rice plant. When the rice is actually ready, then harvesting is the next important process that comes in. In the process of harvesting, threshing and winnowing are two important processes which are involved in the process of harvesting. And then finally, the rice which is actually obtained is stored where it can be consumed or it can be exported. But these are very brief information about the processes involved. When you read through the booklet on page seven to nine, it will explain to you a little bit more about those different processes that are involved. Any queries or questions so far? No queries? Okay, let's look at the information from the chat. And the information from the chat basically gives us a very simple diagram to illustrate or to show the plant rice and a cross section through a grain of rice. We start off with the plant itself. The plant itself contains the stem, it contains the leaves, also a root system to allow for obtaining of minerals and food from the soil. And it contains this section here on the plant, which are known as the panicle. The panicle contains the spikelets, and the spikelets are what contains in them the grain of rice. Okay, so we look at the plant again. The stem, the leaves, we come to the panicles the brown part of the diagram here, made larger, the panicles, of which on the panicles, 
it contains the spikelet, and the spikelet then contains the individual grains of rice. When you take out a grain of rice then, this is what it would look like enlarged. The different layers of the grain of rice. The outermost layer is known as the husk. In the process of harvesting, what would actually happen is that the stalks or the plant of rice is actually cut. The bundles are collected. When this bundle is actually collected, it will be taken through the process of threshing. And when threshing takes place, that is when the panicles are actually removed from the rice plant. When the panicles are removed, then the spikelets or each of those kennels are actually removed. And the removing of the kennels then will put those rice, uh, sorry, rice spikelets onto what we call serves. And from the serves, they are actually lifted so that the husk on the grain is actually removed. And the husk is usually the outermost layer on the grain of rice. Okay, then the next layer on the grain of rice is known as the bran. The bran, if you look at the diagram, is the section which is between the husk and the innermost part or the kernel. The bran is very important because it is this layer when it goes through the processes and if it is removed, then the rice will be white rice. If this layer, the bran is actually not removed, then the rice is brown rice. White rice and brown rice both have the same processes in terms of growing. But when it comes to the harvesting and the milling, that is when white rice and brown rice is actually distinguished. If the bran layer is actually not removed, then we have brown rice. If the bran layer is actually removed, then you have white rice. Inside from the bran layer now comes the starch or the kernel. That's the innermost part of the grain of rice. Also on that grain, there is a section which is known as the embryo or the gem. And it is this section here in orange that allows for a new plant of rice to grow or to germinate again. So this diagram here basically shows us the different layers of a grain of rice. To obtain that grain, it comes from the plant. From that plant, rice plant, it is the panicle that contains the grains. From the panicles, you have the spikelet, and inside the spikelet then you have the different grains of rice in there. But the grain of rice does not come out as white rice. It will come out as the rice in the shell itself, or the grain in the shell. The husk has to be removed first, then the bran, and finally we come to the white rice. If the bran is not removed, then we have brown rice. A lot of people know that brown rice is actually more nutritious than the white rice simply because brown rice contains most of the nutrients, yes, that a rice plant should actually contain. Today, in most of the industries, when white rice is also produced, um, people who manufacture ensures or tries to ensure that whatever minerals or nutrients that are actually taken out through the process, they try to substitute for it. But when we look at brown rice, generally brown rice is more nutritious than white rice simply because where the brand is, the brand layer, it contains a lot more nutrients compared to when it is actually removed, giving us the white rice. Okay, it says here that the brand layer 
is mainly made up of fiber, vitamin B, protein, and fat. So this layer here, the brand layer, is mainly made up of fiber. It contains vitamin B, protein, and fat. And imagine if this layer was actually removed, then those nutrients would also be removed. Any questions? No questions? Okay, we'll move on. The next lot of slides or information that we're going to look at on the monitor should be able to also help you with identifying the different processes that are involved in cultivation of rice. Okay, we start off then with looking at a rice field and the preparation of the rice field. So you have a diagram there showing us generally what the rice field would look like and the preparation of it. This area here is a barrier that would separate one paddy field from the next paddy field. Note, if this paddy field is to be flooded, there is usually what we call a band spelled with a B-U-N-D, which is like a gate that will also regulate and allow the flow and the movement of water from one field to the next. This particular feature here serves as a barrier that separates one field from the next field. If this field is, or it has so much water in it and the water has to actually be drained and regulated, then the band is actually open so that the water can flow through the next field through the next and etc. The band are very good when um, terraces are actually built because if you are in the hill slopes and you need to remove some water from one layer to the next, you open the band and the water flows from the upper layer down towards the bottom layer. Okay, field preparation. Here we're looking at rice growing also in Papua New Guinea. We are discussing about in Java, but also in Papua New Guinea, we do plant rice. The first stage there for rice growing, beside the preparation of the field, we have the nursery of the seeds. The next um, photograph or slide there shows us again the nursery of seeds and maybe the workers now are taking out those seedlings to take them to the paddy fields for planting. Okay, the planting now of rice in the paddy field. You look at the field itself. It's very wet, it's flooded. Rice grows well in maybe an environment or landform of such. But that is actually man-made. The fields have to be prepared to allow for enough water so that the rice can actually grow in. Remember in Indonesia, there are two types of a system that grows rice. One is the sour. And this could be an example of sour because it has to do with wet rice cultivation. And the other one is the dry rice cultivation or tegal. Okay, we're still on planting. Another diagram here showing planting of rice in Papua New Guinea. Look at the amount of labor that is actually involved in planting. There's a lot. And because we are in a developing country like Indonesia, it is labor intensive when it comes to rice cultivation. Okay, some of the rice now growing in the rice field. This diagram here, perhaps the early stage, while the rice is actually growing, and perhaps at the time now when the rice is ready for harvesting. Okay, once the rice is ready for harvesting, comes the harvesting um, time and the process also. Again, most of the work is actually done by humans or labor. A close-up photograph of 
the rice plant itself and the harvesting. You can go to our diagram and you should be able to see the rice plant itself and the panicle, which are the brown areas that contains the rice grains or the seeds. The process of threshing whereby the bundles of the rice plant is actually taken and the panicles is actually removed from the bundles. The next photograph, still on threshing. You can see here the rice plant. All the bundles are now removed and the panicles actually put out onto the canvas or the mat there to dry out. Okay, the next process now is the process of winnowing. Here, the sieves are used or trays that are used so that you can put the rice grains into the sieves and you toss them into the air so that the wind can actually take the husk away or blow the husk away from the grains. The husk is the outermost layer of the grain of rice itself. Remember, you don't eat rice with the husk on. The husk has to be removed. And the removing of the husk is through the process of winnowing. Okay, another photograph there showing the process of winnowing. You can see the husk being removed when it is being tossed up or the rice being tossed up into the air in the sieve. And the next stage after the process of harvesting, threshing and winnowing will come the storage. And usually the rice then will be put into bags or plastics and they can be consumed directly or if we are looking at rice on commercial basis, then it would be exported to countries that would need to export or import rice. Papua New Guinea is one of those countries that we do import a lot of rice, but at this point in time, we are already growing our own rice and um, in the Morobe province and also in the central province, rice has been grown and we are already consuming some of those rice that are locally or made here in our own country. Any queries or questions so far? No queries? Questions? Gideon. Um, my question is concerning the uh, planting of rice plants. Uh, when they plant rice, do they plant them like single plant for a... Definitely. When you plant rice, if you want to ensure that all your plants are actually going to thrive and grow, what you would try to do is you try to plant maybe two plants of rice on one area when you're putting down. But if you know definitely that your rice plants will grow and no problem, you can put one each, yes. Because from that one plant, from that one plant of rice will come the panicle. The Green Revolution has made the growing or the plant rice, rice itself to have more panicles than it used to have before. So therefore, a lot more panicles can actually be obtained from just one plant of rice. But if you want to put two or three plants of rice on one, maybe one time when you dip the rice in when you're planting, that is still okay. But if you look at our pictures and photographs there, you can see that the planters are actually planting one plant at a time into the paddy fields so that you don't waste your plants in the nursery. It would be a little bit more wiser to maybe plant one at a time. But then if you are looking at a possibility of damage, crop damage and a plant dying, then you can maybe plant two. Similar to when you are planting maybe peanut or corn, you might want to put two peanut seeds or corn into the hole because if you just plant one, it might not grow. So to avoid that from happening, you might put two plants of rice down at one time. But there is no rule or law that states that you cannot put more than two. 
Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions to do with rice? Okay, if there are no other questions, I'm going to give you now some more activities that I'd like you to also complete for homework beside reading through the information on the processes of rice. You note that when we are looking at the information from the monitor, we went through very briefly yeah, the different processes. Your task now is to ensure you understand what we mean when we talk about the paddling action. Where does it come in in cultivation of rice? What do we mean when we talk about the stomping action? Where does it come in in the cultivation of rice? Winnowing, threshing, where do they come in in the cultivation of rice? So your task then, beside reading, the following exercises or activities that I'd like you to work on. You should be able to find those activities in your booklet on page nine. Page nine. Sorry, not page nine, page 10. So on page 10, those activities there, what is double cropping? I explained a little bit about that in our lesson yesterday. What is sour? You should by now know what sour is from the summary. In what type of terrain would you find rice growing in terraces? And I explained a little bit about bun, and I'd like you to also define what it is. Those four questions are on page 10 of your booklet for you to complete. Question five, define the following, paddling, threshing, winnowing. And finally, we went through looking at a flow chart illustrating rice growing in Java. And if you have not made note of that flow chart, you would be required to make note of that flow chart to show the different stages in the cultivation of rice. Okay, so those six activities I'd like you to complete for your homework. That will also bring us to the end of our lesson. Class, if you could stand up now, please. To the pilot teachers, our keyword for lesson 114. 144 is Tegal. Good afternoon and thank you, students.